I don't care what anybody says. You're never going to stop learning. So any of these guys that pat themselves on the back, that know everything, they're just foolish. But it's always changing. You want to feel the difference. And when that rod tip is too stiff, that very subtle, different pull is indiscernible from those little taps. People will go up. They don't see bass popping. They make it a couple casts. They leave. But they don't take the time to try and figure out what's going on under the surface. You know, we'll sit there, do five of those drifts, and not catch one fish, and just go. They'll just keep going to the next spot, next spot. Right. Not me, I'm staying there. You know, you have that moment with all sorts of species of fish where you realize you are not the one that's got the upper hand in the fight, and I realized that very quickly. <laughs> uh, that fish, it, it took off, it dug my rod tip right into the water. Hello and welcome to the Salt Strong live stream and podcast. My name is Rich Natoli. I am the host of the show and I'm joined as always by the lovely and talented Ed Gobo from Captain Hank's Tackle. Ed, how you doing? What's going on, Rich? How, how's everybody doing tonight? I, I'm doing great. It's uh, it's a rare Sunday night live stream because of Halloween and yes. we, we didn't want to, you know, people, guests and viewers have kids. They have grandkids, they have neighbors, neighborhoods, and in some, you know, some neighborhoods, they have the treats for adults as you walk around with the kids and people don't want to miss out on the free beer. So we're jumping in tonight um, and we're, we're going to go in and we're going to talk about light tackle blackfish or tog. And uh, I'm really excited about that. Ed, is there anything you want to update people on before we get rolling or do you want to just roll right into it? No, I'm excited for this topic. The tog, light tackle tog is one of my favorites, so. I'm excited for this one. Yeah, I'm definitely, definitely looking forward to it. Uh, so with that, man, we're going to jump right in here and we're going to welcome back to the stream, Captain John Halkius, Jig and Jerks on YouTube. John, how you doing? What's going on, Rich? Ed, how are you guys? What's up? How are you? Good. Awesome. I'm I'm looking forward to this one. You, just to give people a, a heads up, uh, you're, you've been out doing a lot of black fishing lately and you're, you're a little tired today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah going back uh, to back I, to back to back yeah we did i i was mentioning earlier we had uh a, a, a fish finders those of you who are watching who know garrett weir he's got this great group called the fish finders community where he sets up great trips on top boats up the coast up and down the coast uh maryland to uh, rhode island for different species and he had one of his high roller uh tog trips this last thursday uh, uh up in uh newport rhode island and uh gentleman won seven thousand uh, dollars primarily because it was three calcuttas he had an 11 pounder on the first drop wow. uh, and that carried him through uh i finished with one keeper uh so uh, yeah not 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 my best day and again when i'm a i'm a one trick pony when I'm not in my element, light tackle, black fishing, yeah, I have no shot. I have no shot. We should hook him up with Frank. Yeah, you should be uh, hanging out with Frank Mahalik. He'll he'll show you the other end of it, the uh, the offshore trophy tog. Uh, yes, I <laughs> I know. I I I've uh, I've heard a lot of stories about his prowess with uh, yeah with tog. Yeah, but then yeah. I, I had charters the last couple of days. I. I Came back on the ferry, 9 p.m. Thursday, uh, Friday night. Uh, charter yesterday, charter today. So if, if I look a little tired, it's for that reason. Um, I, I feel like I need a day off tomorrow for my regular job just to catch up from three straight days of fishing and you know going crazy with the ferries back and forth from uh, Connecticut and Rhode Island. I'll tell you what, though, it is a a great way to uh, to be tired. Yeah, that's yes, satisfying. <laughs> the satisfying exhaustion. And uh here, let's just let's show this. Oh, Great there's charter. me. There you go. So besides being the greatest human being on earth, G had what we call the comeback today. He uh the boat limited before he had a keeper, and oh. he never quit. He I think he finished with five. G, keep me honest. Um, and he had a nice big one right at the end. That's the one uh, we, we put up on Instagram. Very nice. Awesome. You got it. You got. You never give up, man. 
if you have the slow start, doesn't mean you're not going to have the great finish. And that that's what fishing is. And that's what togging is. It's, it's not a, it's not always a consistent, you know, bailing double digit after double digit. It's sometimes you got to work through, build that bite and, uh, and the results come in the end. So good job, G just staying on it throughout the day, but let, let's jump right into this. Um, I know that, you know, we've got a lot of people that do the offshore deep water togging, right? And then we, and we talked about that with Frank Mihalik, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, but this is different, right? So, so when you're talking light tackle tog fishing, which by the way, is what I do primarily, what mm -hmm. is it that you're specifically looking at? How would you describe in general terms, the type of spots that you're looking for when you're doing the light tackle? So critical is that the current has to cooperate. I mean, Clearly, you need to find the structure, but that's a given. I'm, I'm going to presume we all know that you're not going to be fishing in sand and there's no current, so maybe there's a chance at a tog. No, you, you got to find the structure. So um, last two days, I didn't film for YouTube because we, we were fishing spots that would have been readily – people will know where you are. Right. Um, and look, there's people that know those spots, but I, I'd rather not – broadcast that to the world so no filming but you're besides structure you're you're looking for a spot where somehow the current um allows you to drop down with an ounce or less and that's sort of i don't carry any jigs on my boat over an ounce so every spot we fish from october 15 to november 21 one ounce or less no no uh broomsticks on the boat and no jigs over an ounce on the boat um, and there are a ton of those spots. I mean, we were talking about it earlier, jetties. Um, yep. Typically, <laughs> you, you can get away with that. Uh, things like lighthouses, like they, they, we fished the lighthouse today, and we actually fished both sides of it. When the current turned, we ducked the other way behind it where we were, where the current was blocking it. We started on the one side in the morning. We had, I think, nine or 10 fish there relatively quickly. Um, then we went to the other side. We, we had to battle the north wind on the other side. It, it, we didn't do as well as on the south side of the lighthouse. And then we moved to a jetty. And again, spots where you can get away with dropping a light jig and they have structure. Right. And, and when you're talking, so what, what depth are you looking at ideally? I mean, one ounce, you're not going to get a lot of depth there. So the, the first couple spots we were in that uh, 10 to 13 foot range mm -hmm. um same with the jetty but we ended the day at a spot in about 25 feet of water yeah but a lot of the videos i do show where i'm fishing a beach i'm in 38 to 40 uh, 35 to 40 feet right and we're able to get down sometimes with a half ounce there but that's about it i mean once you get over that, I, you know, no, I, I, I was I, at, on Thursday, I jigged in 70 feet when the current at the beginning of the trip, that's when I got my only keeper. Um, but chances are in those deeper waters, you're going to have periods where the tide is moving that you're right. not going to be able to do it all day. Like we can like that 35 to 40 foot area that I, I love to fish. I don't care about tide. There's never a time where that at least a one ounce won't go down. And typically a three quarters or even a half ounce will get you down. Wow. <laughs> I wish we had currents like that. Yeah. It, we don't have them often. I was fishing last week in an inlet and it was about 30 feet, 35 feet. And I was using, um, I was using the three quarter the whole time. I was using one of Ed's jigs and, uh, it was fine. It was actually straight up and down. It was kind of crazy. Uh, I was barely moving. There was, there, of course, there was no wind either, which made it a little bit easier. But tucked around the outside of the jetty, and you get in that little eddy there, mm -hmm. and you know, if anything, the the water was coming backwards on me, you know, as it spun around. Uh, but that that happened to us today at the beginning when we switched spots. The, yeah, we had the incoming, but the water there was moving like the. Oh, we had part of me the outgoing, but the water was moving like the incoming because you could actually see the water hooking around uh, the yeah. lighthouse and, um, you know, kind of moving the wrong way. Yeah. And I'll say that that for me is a great sign of a spot for tog because of the way that that, that current seam comes around and forms that eddy, it's pushing anything off of those and, mm -hmm. it, you know, crabs, 
are coming around and they're getting spun back towards that structure again, you know, especially Agreed. a jetty. Uh, so I, I love fishing those seams uh, or inside the seams, actually. Seams typically I'll fish for something like a, you know, a striped bass or a fluke or something like that. But uh, when you're talking tog, I get into that still area and I just love it. You know, you end up spinning around. It can be a little difficult to, to maintain your positions, but it's it's typically a good spot. So, okay. So, so you were out, let's say, let's just call it, it's typically shallower water. You're not you're not out offshore in hundred feet doing light tackle. Shallower. So it's shallower, which means and that Tom terrific. I'm looking at the comments. Uh, yeah. Clearly a Met fan. Um, Ten pound line. That's the other critical thing. Every rod I have set up for light tackle togging is ten pound. And again, that's because the area I fish. I'm not fishing wrecks. I'm not fishing some of the crazy structure you guys have down in the South Jersey, Delaware area, not doing any of that. It's, it's little boulder beds and right. I can get away with 10 pound line. As long as I have a, you know, four or five feet of uh, 30 pound fluoro, I'm good. Yeah. I'm using 15 and uh, it's more than enough. It's, it's a hundred percent more than enough because I'm, <laughs> it, yeah, I have no concerns when I'm hooking a tog on, on the light tackle um, in there. I mean, I've pulled in what, eight, pound sheep's head on that thing mm -hmm. on 15 pound I've, I've caught nine pound tog on it you know no big no big deal what i notice is when you break off like if 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 your jig gets stuck on the structure and you can't get it out more often than not the 30 pound floor will break and not the not the yeah. 10 pounds so i don't know to me that and look if you're going to hit a rock with with braid I don't care if it's 30 pound braid or 10 pound braid, it's going to break. They, they are absolutely non-abrasive resistant. So, right. And, and I want to bring up this comment real quick for people that are going to be listening. Why not go ahead and use 30 pound test? Then I'm going to say my answer is 30 pound test is going to create a lot more drag in that water. So when yeah. you're dropping the lightest jig that you can, that 30 pound test is picking up that current and it's actually carrying it. Mm -hmm. much more than if you're dropping 10 pound tests. It's just the, the line diameter has everything to do with it. And I used in the past 30 pound test and I was basically using my offshore reel for the inshore tog. And I stopped doing that because it's just crazy when you're in 20 feet of water and you're scoping out so much because you can't get your half ounce down because there's just too much drag on there. Is that the reason that you're doing it? Absolutely. The only reason I'm doing it. Okay. Yeah. I, I Would I rather have more power? Of course, but makes a huge difference. Huge difference. Yeah. It's a, it's a big trade-off. It's also and, that line floats too, especially braid. So in, in also with the resistance and catching the water, it's also going to float and keep your jig from getting down quicker. Now you're Ooh, using, but you said you're using 30 pound fluoro on the bottom. 30. Yeah. 30. Okay. Ed, what are you using? For mainline, I'm 15 pound uh, J Braid X8. So it's the H strand instead of the four. Um, 15 pound. And then I had this, I found this stuff. It's uh, Nomad Designs. It's mono with a fluoro coating. So it's 20 pound, but it's extremely thin diameter. So that stuff's been, I've been using it all year uh, with for fluke and basically for everything. And it's hmm. it's been great. Gotcha. And I'm using, uh, I use the regular Andy's mono 20 pound, uh, and I want to make it clear why I would not be using that if I were fishing primarily from a boat, but when you're in a kayak and you get snagged and you need to break off, uh, which is another reason I don't want to use 30 pound, 30 pounds to break is a lot of leaning and weight distribution issues. And when you're fishing an inlet or heavy currents, you don't want to be tugging on something and then have it snap and you know fall to the left and and upset yourself i i, I can't stand when the line doesn't break so I, I want 20 pound uh leader and and it's always the 20 pound leader is breaking before the line the only time i ever replace any uh cut any braid is when i replace a leader and i cut off the next couple of inches and uh, you know before i retie i never ever lose because the braid was parted it's it's always that 20 pound leader which is awesome i'd rather lose one jig and uh, a little bit of leader mm -hmm. agree 
Yeah. So, so why don't we talk? All right. So the spots, so you're looking at that depth, you're looking typically for bolder areas and, and let's talk about the current though. Are you looking less current, more current slack tied? What, are, what specifically are you looking for? So for me, the, the best time seems to be right, right before and right after slack. Okay. But again, the spots I'm fishing when, when I'm tucking behind a lighthouse, I'm good that whole tide, that whole tide cycle. Uh, when I'm fishing some of these jetties that I fish, I'm usually good the whole tide cycle. But I do see the the whatever internal trigger the fish have, whatever, you know, walking, I, the analogy I like to make, you're walking by a restaurant at 11 o'clock, you had breakfast at 9. The food may smell great, but you may not be hungry and you may not go inside and eat. But do that at 1 or 2 o'clock when you haven't eaten in a few hours and you're going to want to eat. Right. And I think the fish have something similar that they – they have their time, and they're, they're, to me, the, the time where we seem to get the bigger fish is before and after that slack period. It's almost yeah. like that slack is there. I'm full, you know, the, the, the bait's able to hide. And once that current starts moving again and the bait starts getting swept out, it's it, the dinner bell goes off of them. It's a good time to reposition, you know. If it goes slack, it's a good time to reposition, get to the other side of the jetty. If the water is going to start coming the other way, get into the the uh, the slower area. Um, but you said you're not you're not fishing wrecks though. No. So you're fishing mainly boulder fields or and your and jetties. Are you fishing anything like seawalls or bridges or anything like that? No. No. Is it because you don't have them? Exactly. Like we do. Okay. I don't have them by me. Okay. All makes right. Sense. So, <laughs> if they're not there, can't fish. Yeah, them. It, it, it makes a lot of sense. So I'll I'll put out there for those that do have. Uh, these inshore bridges, which are, you know, a lot of times in New Jersey, for example, it's it's the bridges from the mainland to the barrier islands, the causeway bridges. Uh, it can be an excellent spot to fish. And the jetties. Um, actually, l- let me ask you this. How are you fishing the jetties? Uh, when, you, when you pull up in your boat, how are you fishing around those jetties? How are you positioning and where are you dropping? I'm spot locking, usually at least a boat length and a half away. I'm seeing which way the boat positions itself, and then I'm adjusting accordingly. I get as close to that jetty as I can um, without having some wiggle room because anybody who's had spot lock knows that maybe once every other trip, it might just shut off for some reason. Uh, And the last thing you want is to hit that that jetty. So I give myself enough cushion, and then I, I... tell my clients we we get on the side of the boat whether it's the front the back the side the starboard port side and just pitch it five to ten feet away from the jetty and wait for the bites and build a bite right okay ed is that how you're fishing the jetty i mean we're in i'm in the kayak so i don't i don't fish tog fish in the boat because we don't have spot locker i'm not skilled enough to double anchor and I probably wouldn't do that in a boat <laughs> at the right. jetty, but with the kayaks, I'm I'm fishing the seams and and trying to stay in the in the eddies, um, you know, out of the out of the main current. But I mean, it, we're looking also too. We're scanning with our with our bottom readers, trying to find the ledges and stuff where they're hiding. So it's a little bit different tactic, I think. Yeah, and I I'm typically like you said, John. I'm typically going up close to it. I mean, I'm getting up real close. And I'm dropping in there. But what I end up doing, I find, is working my way backwards and fishing the drops next to the jetties. And, you know, there, there are some around in the areas that I typically fish for tog where you go from the jetty and where it's dry rocks and you back up five feet and you're down, it's it's down to 15 feet. You back up a couple more feet and now you're down to 30 feet and then you're out to 40 feet. And Sometimes I find that I'm actually catching them out, you know, 20 yards off. It doesn't even look like I'm fishing anything near the jetty, but I'm still fishing the edge of the rocks on the bottom. And I think that a lot of people kind of miss that. Uh, they, they think they have to be right up in those rocks real tight, but you don't necessarily have to do that. Um, now, you, you do end up deep snags are much more difficult to get off, though, when you're 30 feet down. But um are you doing that at all? Are you working your way back or are you, or are you finding a spot and you're building the bite there? It's the latter. We, we usually wind up working our way in. What I see is the, 
again, the, the, our, my structure is going to be different from your structure. I don't see that deep drop, the jetty's eye fish. Okay. Uh, it, it goes, I, I have my boat at 11 to 15 feet. And if I go 20 yards back, it's going to be 15 feet. It gotcha. flattens out. So that, remember, these are man made rock walls and right. they're not necessarily rocky areas, the, the areas I fish. So, okay. but you, you said build a bite. That's, that's the, the thing I never understood. And it, this doesn't matter if you're light tackle togging or you're, you're fishing deep guys who give up after five, 10 minutes and don't allow the bite to be built. Right. Um, you see it all the time. You see guys coming up next to you anchoring. They, they give up after 10, 15 minutes, move to the next spot. Um, I've been on boats like that. And I, I you know, it, I, I want to say something, but it's not your place necessarily to tell somebody else how to do their job. Um, I don't understand it. They, 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 that old saying, Rome wasn't built in a day. I truly believe that about Tog, that you, you don't just show up somewhere and immediately start catching fish. You, you get a couple little fish biting, you catch a couple shorts, but that commotion, Skinner had a video a few years ago of how, uh, you know, there'd be a couple small fish and they, they, they would hit the bait and they would get the silt up. And next thing you know, the area was loaded with fish. Right. You really got to do that. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, and I, I think we talked about this on the last podcast, but once you have those fish under you, it's over for any other boat that comes near you. You, you, somebody can anchor 20 yards to your port or starboard. They're wasting their time. They are absolutely wasting their time. Yeah. You have those fish built under you. That little 50, 100 yard radius, the commotion, you're not going to catch a fish. You got to go find your own spot. Go, go a little further, go 100, 200 yards away. But you're, you're really wasting your time anchoring next to somebody who's already got a bite established. Right, right. I mean, they they, they just gang up on the on all the bait, and as long as you keep feeding them, you're in, you're in a good spot. I think it's funny though that you mentioned you know you can't really say anything. I've been on boats where, you know, you stop and you're on and like, I'm talking a party boat, and we're there 20 minutes. I'm thinking you just had 30 people dropping crabs for 15 20 minutes why are you leaving like just stick around for a couple minutes you know because you just drew you're drawing everything in there and all it's going to take is one fish to start going and then the next fish is going to start going and the next fish is, and then and then it's going to be non-stop and i think a lot of people don't quite understand that and uh you know build a bite means be willing to spend some money on bait or catch a lot of bait and be willing to expend it all during the day Mm -hmm. Sometimes it takes a lot of bait if you're going to get any fish. Yeah, we went through, and again, G's on. We went through uh, almost a bushel today. Yeah, well, that's it. greens or whites? Greens. Uh, that's that's a lot of crabs. <laughs> it whites are good when the I, my opinion only when the water gets a little cooler, or if you're fishing deeper. But I think that scent. With the greens, I, I I had a video a year ago, two years ago, where I went through my crab selections, uh, greens, whites, Asians, hermits, and I gave the pros and cons of each. And if I ended the video with, if you put a gun to my head, out of all those choices of crabs, if you only had one crab you could use for the rest of your life, what would it be? I would use greens. They have great scent. They're sturdy. They're hardy. They 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 last, right? The whites you you put them in your trap for two days. They're all dead. Um, <laughs> I would keep greens. Yeah, I, greens are they're like some demons from some other realm. I mean, first of all, they they smell horrendous. Um, <laughs> and but they, I, the I, smell doesn't leave after you shower. I mean, no, it's unbelievable. No. And that slime doesn't leave either. No, it's like this oily whatever yeah. coat. It's it's like if you dump, uh, you know, Procure or or Doctor Juice or something on your hands, where it just kind of sticks there. And no matter what you do, you can still feel it on there. I I actually bought some the other day, uh, not not the other day. Last week I was going two days in a row, um, and I went fishing the week before, and I bought some crabs. And I totally forgot them in the bucket. Now, for those that have watched the show before it came on Salt Strong, I have a habit of <laughs> leaving crabs shrimp. in containers, shrimp, everything <laughs> I in my truck, and it smells horrible. Well, I didn't 
well, I did leave it in the truck. So I'm out two days later driving in my truck and I still have everything loaded into the back because I'm going to go kayak fishing and I'm going to go for tog and I hear some scratching. I'm like, Oh my God, I got vermin in here. And I turn around yeah. and it's the, the green crabs are still alive two days later in the bucket in the back. So luckily they didn't die. They lasted another two days. So there was just four days, no salt water or anything. And I used them on the next trip. I mean, they're, they're just hardy as heck, <laughs> but I got to, I got to, what do you, what do you use besides them? Because you said you decided on greens. What, what would the normal choice be? Yeah. So I, I use greens. Uh, I will use, I will use shrimp um, and sand fleas. Okay. And, and those are it. Well, actually that's, that's not necessarily the order that I would use them. I would use the sand fleas before the shrimp because shrimp just catches everything and, you end up getting a lot of junk fish that way but uh yeah i i definitely definitely go with greens first asian crabs are fine my problem is i just you know i drive two hours to go fishing so i don't want to go and stop on a beach and start you know flipping rocks and catching them on my own i'd rather go in and spend 20 bucks and get a, a couple of dozen or three dozen you know bought <laughs> crabs and they don't sell asian crabs in the areas yeah. that i'm going to so you got James Flynn. Rich, please clean your truck. My truck is immaculate at the moment. <laughs> yeah. Right now. Uh, right now. Yeah. It's partly because of the incident with the crabs that I cleaned it out again. So, all right. So green crabs are your first. Uh, let's say you can't get green crabs. What's your second bait that you're getting? I have two choices by me, greens and whites. So default whites. I mean, you can get hermits too. Hermits are probably the best if you want to catch tog, but the problem with hermits is it, every sea bass and porgy in a 100 yard radius will find your boat. If you use yeah. hermits, uh, which is why I, I tell people, I don't want to see hermits on the boat. I, because then everybody starts catching those fish and that's not right. what we're going after. Right. It's like the people using glow jigs when they're out fishing offshore and they start catching the dogfish and they ruin it for everyone. <laughs> you know, I know some people are going to get mad at that. They like their glow jigs, but they're jigging and actively working a glow jig. And that can, that can have some adverse effects out there, especially if they throw a clam on it or something like that. All right. So you're using greens and whites. Depths of water is going to be somewhere around, let's say 15 to 30 feet um, to, or 10 to 30 feet. Typically 30. you look at 10, 40, 10 to 40, 10 to 40. Not that that makes a huge difference, but yes. Well, it does make a difference, though. It does. Make I, a I had we had uh, actually three ten pounders last year, last charter season, in that thirty-five to forty foot range, all on one ounce or less. Okay. Now, what are you using? So we we already talked about the line. You're using ten pound braid, but what? Let's talk about the gear for people that want to get into this. So what what are you using for uh, noodle? A noodle. Noodle. <laughs> I, anyone who's fished with me in the last two or three years knows how I feel about this. You need as soft a tip and as light a rod as possible. I, my, again, my opinion, and I'm not fishing wrecks. I'm, I, I am a firm believer in the more sensitive the rod. And a lot of people confuse a, a stiff tip with a sensitive tip. I'm talking about a, a, a rod so light that you can actually like feel the difference between a big fish moving with it and the small fish just chomping on it. And I feel that sensitivity, that ability to tell the difference gets lost with heavier or, and, and a lot of my clients will come on the boat and say, Oh, look at this. I got a light action jigging rod and I'll look at, it, I'll go, Nope, that's not going to work. Um, you need something really light and really soft tip. So are you looking at something that's more of a medium action or a slow action as opposed to a medium fast or a fast? So it's really the a light rod with a slower action. Right. Okay. Right. So a tsunami slim wave would be a, the, their medium would be a real, and that's Skinner used that for years in his light tackle jigging videos. Um, I've partnered with a company called VRC. We've been working on rods for two years now. We, they're, they're not quite out on the market, but the rod I use, and I've been doing phenomenal with it. I really feel like I'm one with this rod right now. 
Yeah. Um, when I show it to people, like Nino, one of your guests, he calls me Captain Noodle now. He, like he doesn't understand <laughs> how I use that rod, but yeah. I do great with it. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Dr. And for Noodle. me, it's 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 not about the bites. I balance that rod in my hand, and I have a a, a two thousand um, tsunami evict ten pound braid, really light reel, really light rod. Uh, but that tsunami has decent stopping power. Um, right, it, it's a really good affordable reel. I'm not a person that buys you know the Stellas and the the the. The, the super expensive die was in pens. I did $149 and you get a great reel. I've, I've had them now for three years, never had an issue with any of them. Um, and I balance it in my hand and I ignore all those little tops. And I really wait for, for that, that it's like the seesaw. I'm waiting for that rod to go down. Like it's like, it's going to come out of my hand and that that's my cue to set as hard as I can. Okay. All right. So that actually, what, what you just said, plays into uh, this question from Captain Leon. Uh, why do you gravitate towards a spinning and not a, like a bait caster? So let me Is give it, Captain Leon a plug for a second. If any of you have not checked out his channel, you need to. And he has one of the best lighthouse videos. It's one of my favorite videos of all time on YouTube about my local lighthouse in Greenport, Bug Light. Check it out. I promise you will love it. Um for me, it's easier to get down with the with the spinner. I, I feel like I have to pull when I'm using a small and, and look, Skinner has a different reason. I forgot what it was, why he doesn't like it, something with the way he sets and but for me, I always found it easier to unspool a, a spinner with a half ounce jig if I'm going down 35 feet, um, than trying to with a little bait cast or trying to pull it out. I would agree, I agree. with that. <laughs> yeah, I agree too. Yeah, I'll, for for fluke fishing, I'm fine with the bait caster, but I, I'm not fine with it for tog. And I I I tried it for a while. Actually, all last year I tried it with the bait caster, and I liked it. And then I switched back this year, and I was like, I don't know why I thought I liked it because I like this a lot more. Well, I, I think you questioned me last year too. You're like, why why are you using that? I'm like, because it's easier. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And you were you were right. There was another question here. How long of a 30 pound leader are you using when you're like gear fishing from Dwayne? Yeah, Dwayne, uh, anywhere from three to five feet, probably four foot is the average. It's just in case you get pulled sideways um, that you have a little bit of, of, and again, if I were fishing a wreck, you would need longer leader. But right. it, the small boulder beds I'm fishing, and, and again, Skinner has underwater video of blackfish. Those are the waters I fish. You'll see it. You're, you're not talking about, you know, any type of crazy structure. It's it's little boulder beds. Yeah. Ed, what are you using? Uh, I don't know. A couple, like, I don't know. I'll stretch when I'm tying it on. I'll stretch my arms out like twice. So two, two lengths. So you're, about, wow. you're about six feet. Yeah, no, but I guess. Well, no, that's what twelve feet. What yeah, you're about, about twelve feet. Oh, you're doing this tw twice. Yeah, two. So I'll stretch it and then yeah. stretch it again and then tie it on. So yeah, I I shouldn't be surprised because that's about I do about ten feet, and the reason is I tie an FG knot. I don't want to continually retie it, and I'm fine reeling it through the guides. So we get a lot of a lot of snags. And I have it so that it's, you know, it, like I said before, it's not breaking at the braid. It's breaking somewhere on the leader. It's cutting on the leader. So I'm, uh, I don't want to keep retying that FG knot all throughout the day, especially in the kayak. If I'm fishing from the rocks, from the shore, then I'll just do a short leader because that's not a big deal when you're just standing there. It's a lot easier to tie. Uh, but I, I would say I go way over and go 10 feet just so that I can not have to change out the entire leader. I can just retie a new jig on there. So, so to that point, Larry just asked about the uh, leader to mainline knots or hardware. I've gotten I've gotten away mostly from hardware, although again, Skinner uses uh, fifty pound Spro or Tsunami barrel swivels, which actually will go through the guide easier than than some uh, you know mono to braid knots. But uh, I'm 
I'm, a, I'm number one, I'm a creature of habit, but for me, it takes me 10 seconds to tie an improved cinch to a cinch knot, improved cinch on the braid, cinch on the, on the, on the floral. And I know hardly anybody does that, but I tie it so fast and it doesn't break. And I just stick with that. Yeah. And I get how smooth the FG knot is, but I'm not going to sit. I can't do that when it's windy out and I'm trying to <laughs> do all those wraps. It, for me, it's, you know, I can't, I can't I do it either, so. what I'm saying, but it works. Well, you just got to do what works. I mean, just because I do the FG doesn't mean that everybody should do the FG. It's just my, I'm confident in the way that I tie it. I can tie it without it coming apart in the dark. I can tie it without looking at it. So I, it's just what I've gotten used to doing. And, Look, it takes about a minute to a minute, minute and a half. So it's not a ton of time. But, you know, when you're on the water and you just pulled a fish in or you just lost one, you want to get back in right away. And so you I got the jitters. The, your hands are shaking. You <laughs> want to get back in the fish. <laughs> yeah. I've got this whole weird setup of how I, on the kayak, I, I have the rod in one spot, got the line in my teeth. I have to have a weight of the spool on the leader. It's just, It's a whole thing. The whole thing uh, that's too much for me yeah but i use the fg knot you can use uni to uni you can do it the way john's doing it ed you're doing what are you using alberto alberto okay so alberto knot. Uh, but i do not use hardware uh so skinner likes the the barrel swivels i do not i do not like anything that is going to be a hard surface to snag on anything uh, plus i like to be able to reel the leader onto the reel so I don't want to worry. I, I, I don't want to have to worry about reeling uh, a barrel swivel into the guides at any time. Mm -hmm. So even if it's not going to hurt. That, but the, those 50 pounds are so small. Yeah, they uh, are. But I, I totally get it, right? You're, you're going through your ceramic guides. It's not, it's not the best thing for them, no. Right. You just hear the click. and it, Yeah. You know, it freaks you cringe. out. I get it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, like okay. It's like a <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Whether it's whether you need to be upset by it or not, it, it's it's a little disturbing to me. Um, let's now, see. There were some other questions in here. Go ahead, Ed. What uh, what knots are you guys using to attach your jig to your leader? I'll let John go. Um, one or two, a surgeon's loop, um, or just a cinch knot. Okay. Ed? And this the the surgeons only if I think I'm going to be changing out i got what i found is i'm if i put a three quarters ounce on that might last me two trips i'm right. not gonna so and i have a little more confidence that the the cinch knot and wh whether there's any truth to this or not is less prone to you know chafe against the rock and break i don't know why i i always have that feeling in the back of my head that the surgeon's loop somehow is going to you know fall between a rock and just get sliced. Yeah. No, I can understand that. Mm -hmm. Ed, what are you doing? I'd say a Palomar. Really? Jig to the, yeah, jig to the leader. Mm. Mm. I'm just doing a loop knot, a regular loop knot, you know, so it's, it takes like two seconds. Uh, and I think it breaks easily when I'm snagged. And again, I'd rather lose the jig and keep the leader. So I think it, it's, uh, it's it's and, and when I tie it, I don't tie a big loop on the bottom. I actually keep it very tight. So it may be, you know, just I, I mean a fraction, an eighth of an inch loop at the bottom is what I have. So it lets it still swing freely, but there's not. It's close enough to the uh, to the eye of the hook that I feel it's not going to create any additional snags. So that's what I do. And, and, but you know, the, the real reason I do it is just because I can tie it so quickly, you know, it's just one overhand knot and then you don't tighten it. You just pull it back through itself, twist it around twice, pull it through again and you're done. And, and that's why I do it. And Palomar's even quicker than that. It's a loop through overhand knot, pull the jig through the loop and then pull it tight. Yeah. Look into it. Yeah. I, I, you know, I try to stick with the same thing because that's what I use on when I'm, when I'm tossing out paddle tails, you know, so I, it's, I can just consistently tie the same thing. I just tie it with, a, with a smaller loop. So it's not, it, you know, it's not as big of a loop right against uh, above the head. Uh, let's see there. There are a bunch of questions, but before we get into those, let's talk about the bite. 
You know, you had, you talked a little bit about it, John. And, and I think that is the big thing when you're talking light tackle slash insure slash you're overrun with tons of smaller fish and you got the, the big guys mixed in. Let's talk about the bite. So what are, what are you looking for in that bite before you're setting that hook? The pull, the, the, where you feel like the fish is swimming away with it. And that's the reason we use these really light jigs is because the bigger fish, they see the commotion. They see the, the burgals, the porgies, the small black fish, pop, 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 pecking away, pecking away, biting it, biting it, hitting it. Big fish bruises in, pushes them out of the way. And I, on the trip today, I told the guys, it's like the calm before the storm. You'll get those. Da, 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 da. And then all of a sudden there's one thump and it's almost like a delayed reaction. And what I think is happening is the big fish has come in, cleared out the little fish. And there's, there's almost a pause in those light taps and then you feel your line moving. And again, with the light rod, I'm not concerned about trying to feel the line. I'm letting the rod tell me. Right. Rod bends over, you set the other way, and you've weeded out 10, 12 small fish, and you've caught the keeper. And I right. think that's why some people sometimes struggle with this because they can't tell that difference or they don't have the patience for it. Yeah, they're swinging on everything. Not on everything, because I, I I know from personal experience with clients, I tell them ignore the small bites, ignore the small bites, and I'll see, you know, they're ignoring, and then they'll get one harder bite and they'll set on that, and it's still a small fish. Um, it's really that pull, what we call swimming away with the with the jig. Right, you'll see the line start to move left or right. And, and what size, this was a question in there. Uh, I don't see who asked it. What's the average size? Oh, there, Ben. What's ben. the average size fish that you're that you're getting when you're waiting for that big fish to swim off with it? Yeah, so to be clear, we're catching a ton of shorts too. And that's why the style I'm talking about, it, if you're fishing an area where there's only big fish, you might as well just use a heavier rod, a, you know, a, a more traditional setup, because at that point it defeats the purpose of the, the light, the noodle rod, because the noodle right. rod is meant to help you discern between all those small fish and the big fish average keeper size, 16 to 20 inches. Uh, we had 28 today. We had about 20 yesterday. Um, big fish on the day, usually five and a half to six and a half pounds. But we had last year, we had three 10 pounders. We had our subscriber trip uh, where one of the subscribers, Annette, uh, had an 11 and a half pounder. That's a nice fish. <laughs> and again, on a, on, a, on a really, really, really light rod. On a noodle, on a slim on wave a noodle. type noodle. And, and, and the what's... rod length is, uh, I see the other question. I'm just jumping ahead, Rich. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Six feet. That's that's my preferred rod length. That's what I designed my rod. Uh, the the rod that I used for years, uh, besides the slim wave, was the uh, a St. Croix Triumph six-foot um, medium. And again, because I'm balancing the rod, I don't want a long rod. I also find it's easier to pitch it when I'm near a jetty, when I'm near a lighthouse, when I'm near structure, if I'm casting up to something, just easier to manage a, a smaller rod. But the, the critical thing for me is the having that balance, using it almost like a pendulum on your hand to be able to tell when it's time to set the hook. Yeah. Um, and if you're on shore... I would say you want a rod that is going to be just long enough to help you stay over the tip of that jetty or that structure. So sometimes you do need a longer rod there. Um, let's say you're fishing straight down on bridge pilings from the bridge or from a pier, you might need a longer. So it, it sure. really depends in that case. On a kayak, I'm always going to say I would prefer to use a six foot rod if I'm jigging, but on my kayak, because of the length of it, I need a to comfortably get that rod tip around the front without you know too much leaning and too much trouble. I use a seven to seven six. Mm -hmm. Seven two seems to be the sweet spot for me, but um shorter rods, I, if you can get away with it, I love the shorter rods for this type of fishing, definitely. Ed, what are you using? You're still using the seven six, right? 
seven foot. I have a seven jigging foot? world. Yeah, the jigging world nexus. Um, and then I have the one that uh, John Creeley just made for me that I just got back. Um, and I think that's seven. That might be seven six. I'm not sure. I will okay. double check that one. All right. Uh, let's see. What other are there any other questions that we've missed in there? No, I've been trying to star them as we go. Gotcha. So, John, is there anything that we're missing right now? It's such a limited topic. It's not like our first discussion where we talked about a million things. Right. Um, we went over the noodle rod. We went over the line, the crabs, the structure. Um, and you know How about what? The jigs? Uh, uh, well, it, I use uh, SNS John Skinner uh, mm -hmm. hog jigs. I love them. The great luck with them. They hold up. I'll I'll use the same jig two three trips in a row. Um, that but really, everybody makes good jigs. I feel at this point. Ed, yeah. um, <laughs> sure. example right in front of us. I, I don't think that's as critical, my my personal opinion. But what, what we were talking about where before, the the other thing we, we forgot to mention is you'd be surprised how many docks hold blackfish. Yeah. And our good friend Doc, his, uh, his marina, we catch blackfish there all the time. If it's rough out, we will just go to his dock in, in the inlet here in Mattituck. And there will be multiple keepers every trip just dropping straight down by the pilings. It saves on the gas bill. Oh, it, <laughs> tremendously, <laughs> especially since we both have uh, big twin engine boats. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's Doc's awesome. boat, that thing's crazy. Have you, you've seen that boat, right, Rich? I have. That's the metal shark, right? That's, uh, that's Rick. Uh, Doc's got a 30-foot uh, scarab. Okay. Uh, I, get, I get those two uh, mixed up. Yeah, well, they're, they're both about 85 years old. It, it happens a lot. <laughs> Take shots at both of them right now. Man. I'm not Either taking any shots. No, no, no offense to you guys. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to take any shots at your crew, John. But I'll, so, I'll take shots at you. Well, you're, true you're story. Fine. True story. Rick, Rick's in his 60s. I don't think he's ashamed for me to admit that. But we, we were in a blackfish tournament on his boat a few weeks ago. And a uh, guy sat down who recognized us from the Skinner videos and – talking to us and Rick got up to get something and the guy said, Oh, uh, how old is Rick? And I said, Oh, he's 82. <laughs> and the guy was like, wow, he looks and moves good for 82. He totally believed it. <laughs> I make a lot of jokes to Rick about him being an octogenarian. And again, he's not, but. Well, that's what makes it so much fun. <laughs> but then he could sit down and make you do everything for him. Right, yeah, or and and every fish he catches is a keeper, even the twelve inches. He doesn't keep them, but he, he, uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah. to go back to the jig thing, um, there's there's the old you know classic debate: color catches you know fishermen, not fish. What are your thoughts? Agree. Not not for blackfish. I I think that's I I see customers come with just plain. I that Thursday trip I was on. Uh, there, there's a gentleman named Elliot Sanchez, uh, excellent fisherman. He's a chef, actually. He's just using, uh, he was using bigger jigs, but just plain metal jigs. And I've seen customers with no color on them do just as well as, and I can't tell the difference when I'm using a green jig, an orange jig. Again, this is all my opinion. Yeah. I, I think there is a little bit. That wasn't the answer I was hoping for. <laughs> I'm sorry, Ed. <laughs> well, I, I think that for the most part, you know, the colors do catch the fishermen. There are some colors that I have noticed I seem to do better on. I don't know if I'm just more confident in them. They're more of the natural colors. Uh, Ed, actually, you, there's two colors that I told him. I, I want everything in these two colors. And I don't care which one it is, but one is a black, looks like a muscle. Um, and the other one is kind of, it looks almost like a... Uh, uh, what's the what's the a calico crab color you know so they they look more natural in the water but i i've stopped using the oranges and and all those i have found that i think orange uh and the the brighter colors i catch a lot more sea bass and extra you know bycatch that i'm not really looking for 
Um, so, you know, it's funny. I had a customer order um, hot, their hot pink and blue yeah, um, to stock in his shop. And he says those are the only colors when you're out 80, 100 feet that stay true to their color. I don't know. Could be. But, we're, but, but for today, we're talking light tackle, shallow water. Right. Stick to the topic, Ed. Come on. Come on, Ed. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just trying to I'm just trying to keep the color debate alive. Are you new here? here? Are you new here? For the, for the record, <laughs> yeah, I had a lot of keepers today all on orange. But yeah. I'm agnostic. It, it might as well have been green. I have both. <laughs> yeah. And, and again, Ed, I'll, I'll go halfway in and I'll say, you know, it's what you're con- – a lot of it is what you're confident in. I'd agree. You know, if you think that you – if you think that you're better with a, a certain color – like John, if you were to, I know you're not, but if you were to turn around and say, you know what, I just feel really good about orange. You're probably going to do better on orange because you're going to be more in tune with what you're doing. You're, you're not going to be thinking, well, do I have the wrong color on there? I never catch on this. You're just going to be confident. You're going to be doing your thing. I, I honestly believe that with almost every type of fishing, if you have a confidence bait or a confidence color or a confidence rod, even though it probably, you know, in some cases doesn't matter, it matters to you, and that's all that matters in the in the end. It's going to help you. So, how's that? Ed? I feel that, that way about fluke. I I don't know if yeah. I feel that way about blackfish jigs, but that's about colors. That's that's just me. I I'm agnostic. I, but I get what you're saying because I definitely feel that way about style of fluke fishing. If I'm fishing away, I'm not used to. Even if it works, I'm not going to have the confidence. Right. Mm-hmm. Oh, there are certain things where I'll be next to Ed and he'll be like, just do this. I'm like, I can't, I can't catch a fish on that. You know, people are like, use this. I'm like, I can't because I will never catch a fish on that. And it's, and I know it's because I don't believe I will not because I can't it's because I I don't believe I will. So I'm going to use something else that I'm more comfortable with. And, uh, you know, it's either that or get good and get confident because I think the fish can feel, and to your point, you probably don't feel the same way about tog because it's bait fishing. You know, you're not moving that bait. You're trying to keep it still. Mm-hmm. Maybe you're popping it every once in a while, but mm-hmm. so I can see your point there. Uh, here's a question, Ed and John. Let's hear your opinions on this. Does, shape, does the shape of the jig matter for deeper waters? Let's just start off. Does the shape of the jig matter? I th- oh, well, I'll go first. Um, <laughs> uh, I think the the shape of the hook matters. Mm-hmm. I don't know know so much the shape of the jig itself. You stole my answer, Ed. Sorry. Okay, so go ahead. Go talk more so, about it. So for for the longest time, um, most jig makers are using a Mustad 2X um, circle r- round bend hook. Standard, you know, industry standard. Uh, recently, we switched up into using uh, more of a sickle style. Uh, with the TOG, they have that big giant rubber lip. So when you set the hook, the way it drives the the angle, um, and it has a smaller the sickle hook has a smaller wire diameter, so it's going to be a sharper point, and it'll penetrate easier. So that's what we've switched to. And I mean, Rich, you've you've used them. You you can kind of speak to yep. the abilities on those. Um, but I think the hook matters more so than this the the design of the the weight. All right. And John, you, you agree that the hook, but what's your thought on the hook? You, you might have a different so, perspective. Completely different from Ed's. I, I don't disagree with the sickle. I saw them for the first time a couple of weeks ago. My buddy Todd Mann actually made some um, with sickle hooks. I'd never seen that on a blackfish jig. Yeah. But I, I noticed, and I, I, gee, I don't know if it was you, again, he asked the question, or if it was Abu today, but they were using smaller like the the shank wasn't as long and i didn't like that because i like to get that crab you know in one socket out another and i just felt like that that smaller shank would have made it a little difficult to kind of get that that the point of the hook showing through it so that when they bite it you know you you have a better chance of hooking them again Uninformed opinion here, but I, I I personally didn't like that, and I like that about the the SNS jigs that they have a slightly longer shank, and right. I, I just feel more confident. To your point, Rich, when I'm when I'm baiting up with them, yeah, I'd say that the shape. My my answer is the shape of the jig does matter. 
uh, because certain shapes can get snagged easier than others. Um, but God only knows what shape is going to get snagged over any given structure. You don't know. So yes, it does matter, but there's not a lot you can do about it. Uh, for I was, for what it's worth, I only ordered the banana style jigs. Banana. Okay. Um, as far as the hook, I love the sickle hooks for inshore and light tackle because you're using smaller baits. And I think the sickle works well to go in one socket and out the other. If I'm offshore, I'm not using a sickle on a, on a two ounce jig because the crabs are too big for it to go in one socket and out the other. It just kind of gets lost in there. You can't make the turn on a sickle because it's a, it's a, a shorter diameter uh, around that, that bend. So um, Ed and I have talked about this. I love, but I do love the sickle because I do love hooking these fish inshore in the, on the light tackle in the lip, in that rubber lip, because it, once it's in there, it just doesn't come out. Um, and it does allow you to use a smaller diameter hook, which I like. So, uh, and, and a big part of that is if you're using Asian shore crabs or small greens, if you want to actually put it in the leg socket, they're very thin. So it'll actually fit through there a lot easier than some of these bigger hooks where you just kind of have to blast and then ends up breaking the socket when it goes through. So, well, that, and also the presentation, uh, the way the, when you use the smaller crabs with the sickle hook, it'll keep the crab basically floating over top of the jig. Yeah. So the jig kind of goes out of the, the color, at least the colors of the jig kind of are out of the equation at that point, because you know, the, the crab is, taking center stage yeah if you're if you're using a whole crab that's mm -hmm. you know I, th I think it's better uh all right well w anything else that we've missed before we we call this one guys no i think i think we got all right much everything john i want to thank you for coming on man this is uh always fun man this is great and we're yeah. we keep getting uh i keep getting messages saying well let's get some more tog stuff uh, let's get some more striped bass stuff. Let's keep talking um, the mid-Atlantic. And I've got a bunch of people that were saying, well, we got to cover the Chesapeake. It's the largest, you know, it's the it's got the most shoreline in the United States. You got to be covering it. So I want to let people know that next week we have Sean Kimbrough coming up. He is a very popular author, Chesapeake Light Tackle, uh, Intro to Light Tackle, Fishing on the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, he's got another book I don't recall off the top of my head. He's got a YouTube channel, does a lot of seminars on striped bass in the Chesapeake Bay. And he's coming on next week and he's going to dive deep into uh, how to get out there right now and get on the fish in the Chesapeake. So if any of you watching live on the replay and the podcast, you know, anybody who goes out in the Chesapeake, this one's going to be for you guys. Uh, and then, John, we got to get out there because we, we missed our chance earlier this year because of the, the weather that blew us out. Um, but we, we've got to get out there on the water and uh, and get some fish up there. I, I, I got to find – let me know when you have an opening, and I'll see if I can pull a charter together. So yeah, if I, get, I, I get a week off in – I have a week off in November with uh, <laughs> nine straight charters in a row. Yeah. Um, I know I can't get on for talk. I know that's the impossible one, but maybe there might be a fluke thing that comes up. No, somewhere. but I, I – listen, if there's a cancellation or somebody just needs a fill-in, yeah. I'll, I'll let you know because I think you'll really enjoy this. It's, for me, it's it's the most fun. It's just a lot of fun. And uh, we'll, we're going to we're gonna noodle you up when you show uh, up. I'm, I'm your, down. Leave your seven foot nexus at home. Don't don't bring any <laughs> rods with you. I'll bring a noodle. I, I've got. I actually, John, I do have some that I that I'd like to show you that are old custom rods that are I think would be perfect for it. So okay. I'd like to test them out, and whether we break them or not, it'll be fun to just test them out and see how they work out. Uh, but I think I got some noodles that that'll stand up to the test. It'll be fun, and if we break a bunch of rods, then we can all just laugh about it. Yeah. <laughs> we'll just make it fun all right so everyone thanks for tuning in really appreciate it again next week we're going to have sean kimbrough on we're going to and after that coming up weeks after not to say who we're going to go through striped bass trolling tactics and techniques we've got a lot of stuff coming up uh in the near future all covering the mid-atlantics just think you know and, and we'll, we'll even go further south but we're we're focusing right now on the mid-atlantic and the fall fishing um so so you know stick around come back it, it it will be on monday next week it's going to go back to monday nights at eight o'clock so until then till next week until next episode everyone get out there 
get on the water and get some tight lines.